start talking. Ooh. Look, those lights have come up and presented me here on the stage, so please do continue to come in. We're about ready to start our campaign's plenary. Those of you with eagle eyes will have noticed I'm not David Williams Mitchell. I am indeed a Mavanwi, and I'm going to have the privilege and the pleasure of chairing this campaign session today. We're going to start off with um, a roundup and information about our current Silent Forest campaign and then an introduction to our next campaign, Witch Fish. Now, many of you will know that campaigns are one of the core activities of IASA, and in fact, what you may not know is that they'll have their 20th birthday, as it were, next year. So we've been running campaigns for a long time. They've covered a range of different species, habitats, projects, conservation needs. And we look to develop these campaigns from a fundraising perspective, an awareness-raising perspective, a lobbying perspective. But all of these campaigns have one thing in common the passion of the campaign team that lead them, and the involvement of a wide variety of both members and non-members who are engaged in making conservation decisions for the species that the campaigns are focused on. And I'm not going to take up too much more time today in terms of introducing that. I want to leave uh, that to our campaign team, uh, Simon and Thomas, who will be very familiar to many of you. And indeed, also, when it comes to our campaigns, just because Silent Forest might be finishing officially this year doesn't mean that it's over. It'll have a long legacy well into the future. And uh, one of those legacies is that Simon is now part of our conservation committee and is going to be heading up a working group on campaigns. He's going to take all the experience from this campaign and maybe come after some of you to encourage you to be more involved in future campaigns and to take on the wonderful responsibility and privilege of leading them yourself. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Simon and Thomas. Hello. Hello. Thomas, what are you wearing there? Um, I was, last year, some of you remember, we were wearing costumes, which we're not wearing, obviously, today. And I was asked if I'm wearing my mother's or grandmother's pyjama, which definitely it is not. Uh, because the campaign projects take place mostly in Indonesia, we would like to appreciate the Indonesian traditional form of costume, which is this beautiful wax-made Javanese batik. So, let's get on with it. We have a, a campaign to report on. And of course, it's about birds. And um, we have these songbirds disappearing throughout Asia. And there's some incredible numbers related to that. Um, as my Fanny loves numbers, we'd like to say that uh, a quarter of Javanese household actually keep songbirds, which may be, in total, more than 75 million songbirds kept in, uh, in a household all around uh, Indonesia. And it's more than 200 species of native songbirds that are being targeted and affected by this trade. Based on a new article by Harry Marshall from Manchester Metropolitan University, recently published, it looks like there are more than 3 million white rumped shamas. And just imagine, can those be harvested sustainably? The answer is not no. at all. But well, we have been doing the campaign now. We have got a lot of you involved, and uh, we've been very excited to, and privileged to do this. And um, yeah, we're just going to show a few numbers, just from Efemin and uh, everybody else. And the thing was, we, we had kind of, a, kind of a contest that if we reach over a million, we're going to do a big thing. But uh, if we reached over a hundred, uh, half of a million, we're going to perform a little bird dance. So here we there go. go. Uh... <laughs> You're lucky we didn't reach a million. Imagine what you've had from that. But it is amazing. We have to mention that maybe the original targets we had was 250,000 when Thomas and me wrote the proposal, and then the ASA office get back, no, you need to be more ambitious. Take 400,000. We're like, oh no, it's never gonna happen. But um, 
Currently, it looks like we have more than half a million secured. Of course, a lot of this funding is pledged money, so we don't have them cash in uh, our bank accounts yet. But um, it's, um, as the pledges come in, um, we're going to have all of our pre-selected projects funded, and we're going to introduce new projects which will be um, uh, enjoying uh, support from, from this funding, which all of you have helped contribute. Second very important number is that uh, 192 EASA members participated in the campaign, which is fantastic. Our, our goal was 175, but these are only EASA members, so we have 243 today, including non-EASA members. And this is all, all uh, types of uh, organizations that are NGOs, that are, um, some of them are corporate members, most of them are zoos, but also aquariums have really supported the campaign in a, in a great way. We had the target to produce 10 best practice guidelines. That was sort of our thing, and we were completely underestimated the work that's into that. So we only achieved half of that. We have five best practice hot guidelines for songbirds, which are just about to be finished or is already published. But as a, as a small um, um, excuse for that, we actually managed to um, publish a regional collection plan for Asian songbirds and one long-term management plan was uh, carried through at least the, the meetings and are about to be written up and we have new EEPs and none of that was in our, our plans and hopes for the two years campaign period. And what's even more amazing, a new ISEN specialist groups got established. This is something we were dreaming about within the passerine tag for a long time, but it actually happened and it's not just a, an effort, of course, of the campaign, but the campaign momentum helped this happen. And overall, we think there's a 100% increase in uh, institutions' interest in songbirds. So we're very excited about that. <laughs> But of course there's still problems. We cannot, if we just look at the numbers in the wild, we cannot just say that this campaign has been a success. Birds continue to be threatened. And unfortunately, um, some of them, like these colored laughing thrushes from Vietnam, they come from southern Vietnam. They're endemic to a very small range. And the only reliable places to find these are within protected areas. These birds are not so far from here. They're in a pet shop in Portugal, so you can buy them. And that's um, unfortunately, we, we're pretty sure that these birds have been robbed out of national parks. They have been brought out of Vietnam illegally. People there do get arrested and put uh, and sentenced for these crimes. And birds are coming out in, in this way and they're actually coming into Europe as well. And we're concerned about this because we don't want accidentally to be a bigger part of the problem than the solution. And risking that people or colleagues who might not be exclusive um, a bird curator, but actually ending up seeing nice birds being offered. And there was a campaign about these Asian birds. Let's buy two of them. So we made this um, position statement, which have been adapted by EASA uh, on songbird trafficking. And it's one of the aims of this position statement is, of course, clearly to communicate that we do not want to support this by, by buying such birds. And this position statement helps some of the work. We can be taken to Brussels. It can be shown that we're doing things. And it's even been led into an IOCN uh, motion on action against songbird trafficking, which is, uh, I think, brilliant. And uh, finally, in the last uh, COP meeting, there was also um, some pushing for more attention on songbirds within CITES. And one of, one of the key parts of uh, our conservation-supported pre-selected project wa projects was uh, conservation breeding centers. There were three of them out of six projects, one in Nias, second in Java, third in, th third in Sumatra. Through the campaign, we have built more than 300 some 300 aviaries, 300, yeah. 300 aviaries, which we're almost reaching the, the set target of the IUCN specialist group, but we're still looking for more places because... Yeah, there's, of, of all the species affected by the trade, there's more than a dozen where we believe that the time is running out to a point that other measures like um, public education or, or protection in the wild will not take effect and time to save those species. And that's why these breeding centers are an essential part 
of this campaign. And it's necessary to develop a network of such breeding centers within the region that work together, that exchange knowledge and birds to uh, uh, develop great breeding programs. This is uh, the Orangutan Islands in, um, in Sumatra, working with Ian Singleton. We are piggybacking on this project because there will be a safe infrastructure with veterinarians and, and staff on site. Uh, Besides building uh, necessary breeding, uh, breeding conservation breeding centers, we also do a field surveys. Yeah. Just another day in the office. Which actually a little bit looks like Simon's on a vacation. You took that picture. So we both were on vacation. That's when the vacation comes to the being equal to work. But the field research is essential to know the current situation of many species. And uh, it's, it's not just about writing papers, but it's about hours and hours trekking in the misty wetland forest. The last picture with the guys climbing up the mountain is recently published paper by Christian Devanish, which you can read in last uh, Zookwaria. So I highly recommend it. And just always when you're reading these papers, think about how wet and hard is to write a paper. <laughs> we also had uh, a lot of activities in the region in education. Um, and um, we have done presentations on silent forest in China and Indonesia. Um, and the Philippines, where we've taken up the subject um, and, and starting to do um, some underground uh, uh, works in um, education, uh, conservation education. Key partner to campaign was a small organizations, uh, organization called Green Books, based in Bali. And uh, by, by talking about education, we really think that these small NIAS guys can be next uh, ministries of environment of Indonesia. So uh, take, them, take them seriously. There's also been some fantastic activities within the zoos in fundraising. Of course, this fundraising is a main part of this campaign. And um, this is from the concert, uh, the fantastic concert that was organized by Zoo Watzlaw, where they had international renowned artists performing, producing even a music video, which you can download on our website. Will be available soon. But there's also been a lot of other activities like um, zookeeper parties or zookeeper activities in Denmark, Germany and England which have collected quite a number of funds. There's also been zoo parties which have been dedicated to songbirds and uh, activities like here in Cologne Zoo where they did uh, tattoo um, um, activities on two occasions. Um, or just fundraising through money spinners, etc. One of one of the example how how uh, an idea can multiply become become a fundraising tool in more zoos was the original Heidelberg big poster where where visitors can buy their own stickers of the threatened birds and sort of stick and release them and it was multiply taken by Zoo Moscow if we're not wrong and a few others. And we have these two guys from the Netherlands, which managed to climb some mountains for us, um, which is very impressive because they're Dutch. Um, but it's, um, it was really a, also a fundraising activity. And, uh, and they did it for Hill Miner, which lives on a beach. <laughs> yeah, and the, the, the last thing, basically, the, the new English word I learned today is that we have been installing 10 uh, machines for commemorative coins. And uh, that's the big collector's, collector's things. I do have some. So I hope when you visit your zoo, uh, you will get some of these commemorative coins. Yes. We also had some, some artists um, helping us. So we had uh, Stuart Muir producing those fantastic drawings. We also had um, Carl Christian Tofter from um, uh, from Denmark, who is a famous uh, a bird uh, illustrator who's um, illustrated recently Birds of Bolivia. Um, and we actually have some of these uh, beautiful paintings right here in the lobby so you can have a look at them and you can think about how much money you're going to spend when we do the auction on our last uh, gala dinner evening. 
we didn't thought that we're going to talk here about Species 360 system, but we have to because their other contribution to conservation was that they allowed us to exhibit, pre-exhibit those paintings at their store. So once you will be adding uh, your more knowledge into the 360, 360 system, you can also have a look at those paintings. And if you want to see us one more time in a costume... Last time. Last time, no, one more time, sorry, last time. That's going to be during the gala dinner. And you can even see some dancing. If, really? you, if you put a lot of money into these paintings. So Fair enough. do it. Yes. And we also have a little few other nitbits and tidbits to, uh, to sell. My mother actually knitted little uh, green magpie hats. So um, we're going to sell these for a lot of money. Um, and um, so... Get your wallets out, come and approach us. We might try to uh, have a table in the lobby during some of the breaks, so come and see us and spend some money on songbirds. Maybe we'll make the million after all. Hope so. And uh, one, of, one of the key fundraising tool was the merchandise and selling, selling our campaign merchandise. We earned more than 26,000, actually 26,219 euros by having a profit thanks to your zoos. We sold more than 1,400 cups, mugs, and nearly 3,000 plush toys. So I believe that the European families are overloaded with the, <laughs> with the merchandise, with the birds on that. But it was uh, very nice, very difficult. Thanks a lot to Barbara and our Liberates team which did fantastic work, and thanks to you that you allowed the campaign to fundraise through your zoos and through your visitors via the merchandise. Yeah, so this has really been, um, like Thomas says, a lot of work, because also one of the things was that we didn't want to invest money we didn't have for merchandise, so we actually had to take in your orders before we could have some of these things produced in the first place. And it was quite often like, I'd like to have two cups, but then we can ship only hundreds. So really it was, uh, and I, I hope that the fish people will experience <laughs> some, of these, uh, some of these exciting moments. Yeah. The, another, another key thing which I have mentioned was the cooperation with the Green Books organization. And we got this brilliant idea, which was actually actually based on the original campaign where people were collecting used mobile phones instead of get, uh, recycle the call terms. So we said, hey, let's collect the binoculars. It was a great idea at the beginning. First hundred binoculars came to my office in Prague. So I, we packed it and we sent it to Indonesia, but it came back because actually used binoculars are considered as a military equipment, which you simply cannot send to Indonesia. So uh, what we were doing right now was that everyone who goes to Indonesia stops in my office and gets 10 binoculars, and then it, it's being actually accumulated in Czech Embassy in Jakarta, and then the people from Green Books coming to Czech Embassy and getting them 10 by 10. But when you see the number, what, what, what we have, it's actually almost impossible because there will be queue in front of my office. So we have very nice solution. In three weeks, there is a diplomatic visit of ministry of foreign affairs of Indonesia and Czech Republic, and I already talked to a vice a vice minister of uh, of agriculture of uh, environment in Czech Republic, and I asked them if we can donate to a ministry 1,000 binoculars, so she will bring it with her in a in a Indonesian plane national plane. And the 1,000 binoculars is possible because we. Um we had a few zoos who was very ambitious, and they collected binoculars. And one of them was Copenhagen Zoo. And uh, every time I hinted to Copenhagen that maybe another zoo might have as much as you, they keep collecting even more. So we developed a friendly competition, and we keep pushing Copenhagen to collect more. And we actually, in the end, had two zoos clashing in an epic binocular battle, which resulted from those two zoos alone in 670 binoculars. It's unbelievable. I think it was a round of applause. <laughs> and here, of course, a special thank you to Eddie from Copenhagen and Sandra from Düsseldorf, who made this possible, who was game to, to take this challenge on. And actually, the, just one remark, that at the beginning, we really saw that we're going to set up only Children Birdwatchers Club, 
but we cannot see the adults, how they want to see the birds in the wild through the binoculars. So even, even some adults became a part of the, of the binocular contest. There's also been, like in every EASA campaign, uh, conservation um, is, is the, the, the aim, but to, to achieve it, education and awareness is one of the most important tools. And um, I think personally that um, the education part of the campaign is really what gives us the, the credibility we need to ask people to give us their money to send to projects. So. The education part, even though it's often for kids, it's enormously important to showcase what zoos do in a bigger picture. And there's been so many activities, and it's just impossible to show all of them here. And some of them have been really amazing. And um, there were going to be a presentation in the education, uh, education um, committee meeting later, so have a look at that and see some of the amazing activities. And we hope that we set up and even increase the standard for, uh, for another campaign and there will be even more and more educational activities. And it doesn't have to be expensive and, and it doesn't have to be complicated. Like cheap solutions are sometimes the most fun. Also in sense of uh, activities with birds in European zoos, there's been an, a great increase of activities for songbirds. Um, not only the best practice guidelines, which are now available and have a high standard, but also, and, and these best practice guidelines are extremely valuable when we work with these birds in region. When we work with partners there, we can produce, uh, uh, share these documents one-to-one -one and have them even help developing them. So we really have guidelines that are not only useful in European zoos, but are useful in the conservation breeding programs on site. We also had this um, new style um, uh, regional collection planning session, which I think still stands at a record with 145 species um, of vertebrates that was uh, evaluated in two days in Budapest last year in May. Um, so we published a um, um, passive reformers taxon, um, uh, or um, what do you call it, an, an Asian songbird regional collection plan, which is a, like a supplement to the regional collection plan we have, but it's in the new integrated style. And of course, breeding activities are ongoing in European zoos, and um, the, some of the core species, like the German green magpie and the Sumatran laughing thrush um, EPs are now established. It's also been very important, especially in the last six months, for us to establish how the campaign is going to continue in the future. And we have to the one side, of course, the EAS Passer Uniformist Tag, which is the, the, the tag which has sort of had the working group of which the whole idea of developing this campaign came out of. And then we have the Asian Songbird Trade Specialist Group, which have developed in the last year or so. And with those two entities um, in mind, and especially under the EAS Passer Uniformist Tag, we're going to develop the Silent Forest logo and the Silent Forest name into the new EASA trade working group. But it was a bit, bit tricky because we started recently receiving emails whether we can offer some birds because people misunderstood that Songbird trade working group is not selling birds. But in order to make it clear for everyone, we have decided to change the name into the EASA Songbird Conservation Working Group, which should be clear for everyone right now. I hope so. And, and anyway, this, this working group will continue working on the Asian songbird crisis, um, but it might evolve um, further in the future um, naturally to embrace other regions of songbirds in, in trouble or other conservation issues, of course. And right now, it's probably the best time to appreciate the organization's IASA members who have donated the, 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 the biggest sum of the money. So uh, we had this silver, golden and platinum certificate yeah. and we would like to use the opportunity to invite representative. Just too early. We, so, we just need to yeah. mention that everybody's gonna get a certificate, oh, you yeah. know, but yeah. only when the money is in, of course. So when you send in your money, you get a certificate and, and the sum you have pledged or the sum of money you do uh, send in. And we have um, 
we already have some platinum donors. And that's, of course, not those who pledged that platinum. That's those who actually send in more than 10,000 euros already. And that's a, a quite amazing uh, group of Zeus uh, or organizations who helped us a lot. And that's um, right there, almost 200,000 euros for conservation. So right now is my... <laughs> So we would like to use the opportunity. Can I right now? Yeah, yeah cool. Yeah, now you can. Uh, so we would like to use this opportunity uh, to invite the members of those organizations on stage and to hand them over a pro forma certificate. Yeah. Uh, so actually, we mean it seriously. So those who are on stage, they can start getting up and, and coming close. There's a tail. I see you there. Yeah. Everybody like Cologne Zoo, Zoo Liberate, Sea Gap, Chester Zoo. Leipzig Zoo, Opel Zoo, Heidelberg Zoo. You're pronouncing the German one, right? Copenhagen Zoo, Zoom Erlebniswas Gelsenkirchen. Yeah, that was what I meant. Uh, Zoo Berlin, uh, the Foundation Sacre, uh, Zoo Marlow, and Zoo Basel. So. Please come on stage. Please, everybody, give them a huge applause. So, who is the chair? Okay. So, there's so many people to thank, and we actually don't actually know where to start. But this has been so uh, a rewarding and, and fantastic experience. Um, and um, yeah who to mention, who not to mention, but um, there's a, a special group of people who've been um, helping us throughout this, and that's the campaign core team. And we'd like those to come on stage as well, before we let the fireworks and everything off here. Um, so that's gonna be for the um, um, education uh, and the coordination of education around Lucia, Constanza, and Julia. So those of you who are here, please come up. I think it's unfortunately just Lucia. Then we have uh, merchandise and communication. So that's Barbara and Matthias. have been extremely active. We had technical support and knowledge support, which has just been important in all aspects where things had to be discussed. So Andrew, David, Roland, and we had Nigel Collar and Kanita from Traffic, which were our partner organizations. And then, of course, we had a lot of support for the EEO. And um, we need to mention and see on the stage William, Laureen, uh, Sandrine and Mirko. So please come up here. And for these guys, we have a, a special personalized gift. Um, and actually, we just want to say thank you. And, um, and I'm going to split this. And the costumes you, you see when you go to the gala dinner and you have your wallet ready, then we'll talk about costumes. All right. So. Um, these are the guys who made the campaign possible and the uh, protection and support for the songbirds. So we hope you can beat that fish. <laughs> Go songbirds. Go on songbirds. Thank you. Thank you very much. And actually, I realise that Thomas and Simon thanked everybody apart from themselves, so I would actually like to call for another round of applause for being such great campaign leaders. And so, yes, I very much feel that the gauntlet has been well and truly thrown down to our next campaign, A Witch Fish. However, just as this Silent Forest campaign was the first campaign focusing on songbirds, our next campaign is the first campaign that we have focusing on fish and aquatic marine resources. Checking, I've got that spelling right. 
but also a great opportunity for us to work with campaign partners at UAP and EWM as well. And so, again, I'm not going to say too much more. I'm going to invite our current campaign chair, Claudia Gilly, um, up to the stage, and she'll be the one to introduce you to our next campaign. A bit of water as well. So thank you very much for introduction and uh, I'm glad to present you this campaign. It was born from, it was uh, proposed by the TAG together with members of the Education Committee and with uh, Laura Mayers from the office and we had a, a lot of work in trying to make a presentation and a proposal that would fit the needs and the purpose of these campaigns uh, to be applied with uh, on uh, aquatic uh, species. Next. Oh, okay. Why this campaign? This campaign is because we really need to mitigate the threats to the aquatic fauna caused by indiscriminate fishing. And in general, these are data that we are collecting from uh, uh, FAO report, and this is the FAO report from 2018. And basically, so that you have some numbers, we all work with numbers, we're talking about 90 million tons of fish that is being uh, captured is the orange line uh, every year in the waters worldwide. The green or as, uh, blue, the blue part is the aquaculture sources. Most of it is coming, is uh, being dedicated to algal uh, aquaculture, but still, a lot of the fish aquaculture is being uh, fed with the fish meal that is coming from uh, fish resources. This is a slide showing uh, world fish utilization and apparent consumption. And uh, average annual increase of food fish consumption is 3.2%, and it's basically outpaced the population increase in the world, which is approximately 1.6%. And pro capita, if we consider the amount of fish that we are consuming, uh, it was around nine kilos per person in the estimated, of course, in 1961 and we're reaching 20.2 now pro capite. Italy is one of the highest, is around 25%, so it's really high, 25 kilos per, per person. And uh, where are we, we at? I mean, uh, we can say, and these estimations are not done by, by, by ourselves in the committee, but they're done by specialized people who monitor the fisheries and all the situation out in the sea and uh, scientific entities that we uh, looked at in order to prepare all the documents for this campaign. And we can say that basically 7% of the species are underfished, but the 59.9, which for me is over 60, uh, are fully, fully fished. And then moreover, uh, 31, 32 are fished at a biological unsustainable level. So it's time to ask a question. And I tell you something, this is the logo of the campaign. The name is Which Fish? It took us a while to vote on the name of the campaign. And then we had a long discussion within the committee to whether we would put a question mark or a statement mar a mark or nothing. And uh, because there are still so many questions to be answered, uh, we decided at the end that the question mark afterward would actually fit the needs and the, and the thoughts of the people that would participate to the campaign. So you really need to ask yourself, is this fish the real fish that I really want to buy? And uh, we are going to help you with this. The team. Uh, the team is a very important group. Uh, is very important, and the group was made by 
ourselves from Genova. Uh, I was the chair together working with Bruna Valettini who is, uh, has uh, run as a leader uh, a life program in Europe called uh, Fish Scale. And then we collaborate very strongly with Nausicaa and Lisbon. In Nausicaa they have a program that is called Mr. Goodfish that we did uh, participate to. So the knowledge was coming from uh, these aquaria that are fully dedicated with resources that come from education, research and, and conservation that dedicate the resources to run campaigns, similar campaigns and that can put the knowledge into this one. And then we had um, and from Nausicaa, Florence uh, Uron was the key person participating to the team. And then we had uh, Oceanari Lisboa, Teresa Pina, uh, fantastic participant, very thorough. I mean, she did the work very strong and let's go ahead. I believe in this campaign and let's go for it. And then Rockla Anna from Rocklauzu, who did all the graphics and the design and uh, worked on the logo, working on the brochure and moreover, all the people from the, from the office. But there's a very important achievement that I can tell you already from now we have achieved, which is that uh, this campaign is the first campaign that has the participation of the three organizations that keep uh, aquatic species under human care, EASA, EAAM, and AWAC. We're working together, all the institutions that will participate, will have uh, the use of, and uh, utilize the MOUs, and at the end of this session, we will actually sign this MOU uh, with the other associations. So this is an achievement already without even having started yet. The topics. <laughs> thank you, thank you. The topics, we have three main topics. Uh, one is uh, dedicated to sustainable food resources for human consumption, which will involve the institutions and basically all institutions will, participating institutions and signing up institutions will decide whether and which type of improvement they want within their own facilities. And so like establish the number of species that they serve in the restaurant, in the bar, in the cafeteria for the staff, anywhere. And, uh, and uh, decide, okay, I have uh, this number of species that I serve uh, among these, only a few are sustainable, I want to improve and I can certify myself and improve within the campaign uh, period of time of 10% improvement, 5%, 20%, or even 100%. And um, then uh, we have a second topic, which is the fish that is dedicated, uh, that is given to our animals. And this is where none of you can say, oh, we only have a terrestrial collection and therefore we're not so much inclined in participating to this one because most of you have animals that probably eat fish, probably all of you. So every one of you can participate to this campaign even by just uh, engaging the visitor, teaching the visitor what this campaign is, and possibly adjust the food consumption of your uh, fish-eating animals. And then the third one is uh, a sustainable collection planning for the aquatic species. And this is uh, more, or, uh, more uh, directed to aquaria. We basically will use the AWAC guidelines and uh, uh, Joao will uh, talk more about this after, but basically those guidelines will help us help the curators and managers of the zoos to choose the right fish when they decide to implement the collection plan. So this is what we can do. We can engage our visitors and uh, have uh, events. Uh, we've seen fantastic uh, examples before. I was actually taking notes already and uh, I will keep in touch with Simon and uh, figure out what we can pass from one to the other. Fish and birds, fine. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then uh, schools, children, uh, they are the future. And so we really need to work with them and uh, the, the power that zoos and aquaria have is basically empowering uh, the, the young people 
And uh, sometimes I discover that when I speak about this, they know already much more than we do, but they need answers. So we, we should find these answers and make sure that, uh, that we can give them some. And then, as I said, the, the public, the curators, the zoological uh, managers and directors is like a personal engagement. I want to make a change. I can do it now. Let's go for it. Tools. I have uh, some gadgets here. We just made some uh, mock-ups uh, of uh, rulers and uh, t-shirts and uh, hats, uh, mugs and uh, bags. There's a bag here and things that you can use for uh, for your um, for um, engaging the visitors and uh, use for the dissemination activities. We have a website ready, and we will use the website uh, not only to tell you stories, provide recipes, uh, tell uh, what happens to certain species, but you also will find uh, fact sheets on certain species that can be eaten and can be taken. And uh, there's a decision process here that is very important. We decided to involve only species that are in the green list as to avoid any discussion with the stakeholders. So you will not find any list of red or yellow species, only green list. And when you will participate and open the fact sheet, you will see that there are not so many. So that's something that really will make you think. And then uh, we have a lot of other stuff information brochure, banners, uh, merchandise. So you really can participate and have all the tools that you need and the, answer, and the questions answered. Fundraising, how? How, like uh, every other previous campaign. I mean, we can do inside uh, the institution with the tools that we are talking about, and we can do outside with Facebook, with the website, with newsletter. The committee members have committed to an appointment uh, to prepare the newsletter, four newsletters per year during the duration of the campaign. And then uh, why, why? Why are we collecting money? Because we are identifying projects for each of the three issues. And uh, at the moment, uh, we will be working with uh, AWAC and EAAM to consolidate these projects, which are basically dedicated to human consumption, animal consumption, and uh, animal uh, being raised in facilities. So at the moment we have uh, uh, one big project ongoing on alternative food for, uh, for aquaculture species and looking at uh, algae, looking at insects, looking at jellyfish, looking at all sorts of things. And uh, in situ elasmobran conservation project, this is going to be involving the phytag very strongly. Um, and then uh, another idea that came from the curator, the association of uh, French curators of aquaria was to organize group of, uh, of training to uh, go aquaria by aquaria around Europe and uh, basically uh, create uh, core groups of people that can work on uh, breeding uh, captive fish. And uh, how much the target is the same as, as the previous campaign? So platinum, gold, silver, and let's see if we can go over platinum this time. I don't know. I don't know. We will see. Uh, we also decided to try to evaluate the participation to the campaign because this can make a change. And uh, I committed myself to do this. Uh, to try to uh, get results from you. Uh, and what does this mean? This means that uh, all the participant institutions will basically fill in a questionnaire before and after, and we will try to give numbers. And these numbers can go, they can be the numbers that we can use when we lobby, when we go out and uh, talk to the public, when we go to Brussels and say what is the importance of facilities like ours, we have numbers that we can produce. So this is a questionnaire, is absolute, everything is absolutely volunteer, as in any other campaign but it really goes to the soul, so you really need to think about it and probably think that the participation is, uh, is, uh, is, the, mom is the right moment to go for this. So why should we 
work on this because overfishing is a problem for every one of us. There's not one person in the room that doesn't get touched by this problem. And zoo and aquaria really have an important role of empower, empowering the visitors and teach people and tell people to ask questions when they go to the market to look at the label and say, uh, where was this fish caught? First of all, which fish is this? Sometimes you see the fish, there's a scrubble on the, on the label, you don't even know what species that is, and it might be the most endangered species. Uh, so understand what you're buying, understand what you're doing, and, and possibly go towards the right direction. Uh, the subscription will be uh, through the website, and you can see the address here. And uh, all the information can go to, can be received by info.witchfish.eu. And now I really want to thank uh, the members of the of the committee. And uh, my day today is uh, my last uh, day as a chair because uh, I'll be leaving Aquario di Genova and I'll be working in uh, Naples uh, from uh, the first of October onwards. And so I, um, I leave the position of chair, and the chairing of the campaign will be done by Bruna Valettini from Genova and Florence Suron from Nausicaa. I think they're very experienced people, and they will do a fantastic work. I will be sitting in the committee from outside, and probably one of the first dots to put in the, in the map, the Naples Aquarium will probably stay there already from next week. And then uh, Anna from Wroclaw, very precious help. Teresa, fantastic person, very thorough, very determined to, to get to the, to the point and get results. Daniele, who is uh, from Zumari in Italy, who is member of uh, the uh, education committee and uh, will be talking more about this uh, during the education committee meetings, both the closed one and the open one. And then Mafanwe, for sure, Laura, Sandrine, Mirko, all the people that really made this possible. So thank you, and really please come with us and participate to this campaign. And now, without further ado, I would really like to introduce my my speakers, our speakers, the invited speakers, each one uh, for uh, a different topic. And unfortunately, Javier Almunia was supposed to be here as well, but he had a personal event and he's, he, he wasn't able to come. So uh, the first speaker is uh, Philippe Vallette from Nausicaa. Philippe Vallette is the general manager of Nausicaa, and Nausicaa is the Centre de la Mer in uh, France and is also chair of the committee of the International Aquarium Network. He will be speaking about, not only about Nausicaa, but also about the experience they have with the sustainable uh, campaigns uh, like this one, and mainly uh, Mr. Goodfish. Thank you, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Claudia, for the fantastic work you did. Um, so um, I'm going to, to well, allow me first two slides of advertising. So Nozica is a national sea center uh, in the north of France, in Boulogne-sur-Mer. We have opened in uh, 1991 we have had uh, already uh, more than uh, 17 million visitors, and we have opened last year a new uh, expansion on the high seas. Uh, we are also a center of excellence of uh, the IOC of UNESCO. Our mission is very um, concentrated on the link between human beings and the ocean. We, uh, our mission is really to inspire people to discover and love the sea, 
which is an essential part of life, as you know, and a valuable resource both today and in the future. Raising public awareness on the need for better sustainable use of the ocean, offering a new perspective and solutions for the future of mankind from the ocean, and offering people a chance to participate, act, react, and express themselves. So we have many uh, activities. Uh, there, there are a few ones. Uh, conservations. We promote what we call the Blue Society, uh, which is blue economy, but uh, appropriated by the, the general public, so by the consumers. Uh, education, of course. Uh, we are involved in many European projects. We are presently opening a, a living lab. And uh, we also have the Mr. Goodfish campaign I'm going to talk about. So um, Mr. Goodfish is a European program that raises awareness on the importance of sustainable seafood consumption among the general public and professionals. When I when I say European program, we are, we are at the origin three aquaria. Uh, the, we we are um, Aquario de Genova, uh, the, the Aquario de la Corogne, and Nausicaa. Um, it's an innovative approach. We raise awareness among seafood consumers when they are the most concerned what is to say at the restaurants and, um, or at the uh, fishmongers. Involving the entire seafood value chain, fishermen, seafood producers, all sales and so on. And how can we do that? It's because we have only positive recommendations. No blame or ban. We promote sustainable options to professionals and to the public at large. For that, we, um, we, we do specific for each coastal area. We, rec we have recommendations for specific uh, coastal areas. Uh, in France, we have uh, Channel and North Sea, uh, Brittany and Atlantic, and Mediterranean Sea. Involving all actors, thanks to the fact that we have only green list, no orange, no red. And then we can um, bring to the, to the table scientists, fishermen, restaurant owners, fishmongers, all sellers, consumer associations, etc. All the chain of custody. We have a seasonal criteria, and the committees meet every three months. And it's a positive list based on three criteria, the size, the status of the stock, and the season. We also uh, work on sustainable aquaculture, uh, which has been requested by producers, producers and restaurants. And again, involving all actors, scientists, producers, institutions, all sellers, uh, consumer associations. There is a committee meeting every year, and we have criteria developed with a committee of experts. Identification of sustainability indicators in aquacultures, in aquaculture. So why? Is it our role to do so? It's because we are in the middle of all the, the, the actors of the, of, a society, of the society. And the aquariums are considered as the most reliable source of information about oceans. And they are the third most important source of information um, after TV, press, and I would say internet, of course. Uh, so, aquarium and zoos are powerful, uh, are tool for powerful knowledge transfer. So, uh, this is, I would say, the, the, the second introduction to the, the fish uh, 
uh, to which fish, and this is the part on uh, why the consumers are concerned in this campaign. Thank you for your attention. Our uh, next speaker, Stefan Enar, the general curator of Nausicaa. He will be speaking about uh, um, their methodology of feeding animal in uh, feeding their fish uh, with a in a sustainable way. This presentation was supposed to be shared with Javier Almunia, who would be the representative of IWM. He's the president, current president of IWM and he would have sp spoken about the uh, marine mammal part, which is uh, representing a lot, many, many tons of fish uh, fed to the marine animals. But unfortunately, he could not come, so Stefan will make sure that uh, the message goes through for any type of species. Welcome. Yes, please. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, merci beaucoup, Claudia. Uh, yes, I would like to say first that this is a joint presentation by AAM and Nausicaa. As uh, Javier is not there with us today, let me introduce you to AAM for those who don't know. Um, the European Association of Aquatic Mammals um, was formed as an interest group in 1972 already uh, at a meeting in the Netherlands. In August 2012, a non-profit association by the same name was established with its head office located in Brussels, Belgium. The AAAM's membership includes veterinarians, biologists, zoo and marine park directors and managers, trainers and caretakers, researchers, students and other persons who devote a significant amount of time to the in-situ and ex-situ welfare and conservation of marine mammals through research, medical care, training, education, conservation, management, and related activities. So you were already introduced in Nausicaa by Philippe. Um, so uh, this presentation is about feeding aquatic uh, animals in our institutions. Um, well, the questions are there. Uh, I, believe, I believe it's part of our job to think about it and to, uh, especially in those days. Uh, our population may differ, uh, but uh, not the food we give our animals. Um, would there be fish or would there be sea mammals? Would there be birds? Uh, um, we are, all have to, to find the, the, right, uh, the right seafood or the right aquatic food to, to give our animals. Um, the question is always the same. We're looking for the most palatable foods to make sure the animal eats, uh, to the, the, the food that has the right profile in terms of, for example, uh, uh, fatty acids, um, to, to make sure that uh, the vitamins are included um, and, uh, and the animals have the proper diet to, diet to, to, to grow and become mature and breed and, and breed properly. Uh, you also have, uh, of course, a question with by quality, uh, we need to make sure that uh, this food that comes from the wild bushmeat uh, is uh, is not full of parasites or uh, full of um, uh, uh, Vibrionacea, which is very common bacterial found in aquatic food. Uh, so that's it has to do with hygiene, the way we prepare it. It comes deep frozen, for example. How do we thaw it? How do we uh, how do we make sure that uh, no propagation or contamination was achieved during the process? And today, especially, there's a public image uh, that is attached to that. This is a question from our audiences, all, all our audiences, visitors, journalists, um, teachers, they, they question. So, um, um, well, I'm very happy, we are very happy that, uh, that uh, this is a joint uh, uh, process that links EASA, that links uh, AAM, and that links also uh, UAC, uh, because uh, we're all concerned. 
Um, as I said about the public image, we're in a world that it is changing. So societal change, especially. Um, so some questions do raise. Uh, it is written, but no need to say that. We want the best for, for the animals we hold. Uh, we want also to, to be able to tell nice stories to our visitors, stories that we can be proud of um, on the subject. And if we can do that, it's even better. It's even better. So um, let's focus on three questions, maybe only three questions. Um, I believe that, uh, I believe that uh, we all one day had those questions in mind. Uh, what is the best to our animals? If you consider, for example, um, do, will they do better if we give them the best food for, like we do for us, um, like some cat food adverts we can see on TV? Um, do we need to give uh, fish fillets to, uh, to our animals uh, when they used to eat uh, heads and bones? Um, that's the question. Um, especially uh, when you consider the amount of energy that you're giving and the amount of energy that they spend uh, in the enclosures, with comparison of what they have to spend uh, in the open sea, for example. And they don't have to avoid uh, uh, predators in, at, in our enclosures, as they have to do. Or they don't have to spend energy to hunt all day long uh, for some species when they're starving. Uh, we give them uh, the correct amount of food every day, so the amount of energy that is requested is uh, probably different. Um, also, we live in an era of food waste. Uh, I'll just give you a feature for French population, French, French citizenship. We believe that 20 kilos of food are wasted every, every year by, by each French citizen. It can be less or more in other countries in Europe, but it's close to that. So uh, uh, when we feed our animals, do we... Um, we sorry, uh, when we feed our animals, do, do we fight against, do we ignore, or do we participate to the global food waste? That's um, some question that needs to be addressed. Um, by giving our animals the closest food to what we believe it eats the most in its natural habitat, do we provide the correct balanced foods in, in our protected environment? That's the nutritional um, approach and uh, uh, it, it makes more and more sense today. So uh, let me give you one example uh, um, that we, we, we faced recently. It's the manta ray case. Uh, um, it's uh, Mobila birostris, the giant one, um, but feeding them uh, in, in aquarium. Some aquarium hold them. In Europe, uh, there are two aquarium uh, keeping manta rays. Um, and so uh, we know that in the sea, they, they, they prey mostly on, on zooplankton, fish, eggs, and fry. This is what can be found in their stomach but we don't know how much time they spend. We don't know uh, the real concentration of the, of the food, uh, the place where they feed. Uh, we, there are ideas about that, but uh, so the, the amount of energy that is spent to, to collect the food by the Monterey in its habitat is little known. So uh, what is recommended in aquaria uh, worldwide is uh, a diet made of krill and mashed smelt two components that are very little found by those animals when they go uh, feed, when they hunt uh, in, in the open sea. Um, you need to know that those animals are fed using scoops. Uh, they are trained, so they come to a target and they're given uh, a scoop of food. This is to avoid wasting because you could also spread the food uh, in the whole tank, but uh, you, you will understand that those animals that can with wing spans of three to four meters, sometimes more, uh, need huge tanks. So just imagine the amount of food that you, you, had, you would have to put in the water. Uh, so uh, this scoop system is to make sure that the animals has the right amount of food every day and not the other fish in the tank. It's it and this animal that's eating. And uh, it's also a good way to, to get close to the animal and to see uh, that is he's in good shape to, to see it very close. Um, so uh, there are issues by giving krill and mashed melt. First, this is not definitely not what they have uh, uh, in the open sea. And then there's a, there's a cost issue. Uh, think that uh, you need to give those animals that are swimming. They're swimming all the time, so you need to give them uh, a good amount of energy to 
private debt and the expense, and uh, it's about eight percent body weight for a week. Uh, I don't know uh, what is the weight of the Manta in uh, Lisboa, or scenario de Lisboa today, but it must be something far above 200 kilos, I believe. <laughs> yes, indeed. So ours is uh, baby one, so it's starting growing, but it's already close to that weight, so uh, eight percent of krill. Uh, today. Uh, the krill is bush meat, uh, so uh, it's, I mean, you have to rely on the, on the purveyor. Uh, you don't know uh, exactly how it's been collected. You don't know exactly uh, when it has been frozen. So uh, we witnessed that uh, by th when thawing, we had very different results in terms of bacteriological contamination at, uh, uh, every day. Uh, just sampling every day made big differences in the results. So concerns about uh, the risk for the, for the animal to, to be given this kind of food. And also, there's an ethic uh, issue. Uh, you know the krill is the food for the large sea mammals that are endangered. And uh, with the global warming, the amount of krill available for those animals is uh, getting uh, smaller. So uh, why should we go and collect that when there are animals starving that uh, we want to protect? It's, uh, it doesn't really make sense. So uh, um, we had to work on this uh, um, um, because uh, we, we thought it was our, uh, we, we had to. <laughs> um, we need, so um, the alternative food that we tried and developed uh, was made uh, from uh, five tons uh, we can get every year from local industry of cultivated shrimps. Uh, so it's uh, uh, gambas, uh, pe penis, uh, um, and uh, those, uh, those farms are um, organic labeled. Uh, the, the, um, the shrimp come from Madagascar, for example, uh, as uh, raw and deep frozen. It is cooked and according, uh, cooked on the French uh, territory in French industries. And according to the regulation, the, the, the cooked uh, prawn cannot be um, frozen again. That's, uh, that's forbidden by the regulation today. So uh, um, when it's uh, when there is an accident in the, in, in the cooking, for example, when, the, when the, um, uh, it's overcooked, uh, for example, then it cannot be sold. It doesn't match the, the standards. So uh, it's supposed to be uh, destroyed. Uh, it, it, hap it occurs to the, to the, um, to the, the, the people uh, of this industry uh, mind that uh, that was not a good use of this uh, steel, quite interesting source of uh, protein. So um, they kindly um, offered us to use it. And so we tried and see what we could do with it. Uh, it well, it looks like the I mean, analysis shown that those films were very, very high in energy, uh, full of uh, the right components, the right fatty acids, everything. So, um, so we said, let's try it. But uh, to decrease the amount of energy that is uh, included, we uh, decided to use water uh, as a ballast. So um, this is the, the purpose of the fish jelly cubes. So the, the jelly is cut into cubes that are just the right size to, uh, to be swallowed by the, by the manta. And uh, of course, uh, vitamins, a few, uh, little vitamins, just enough. And the result is a perfect to us alternative food. The bacteriological quality is perfect. Um, the nutritional content is uh, absolutely similar to, the, to, the, to what we can obtain with krill. And in terms of ethic, we feel, we feel better with that. Um, so uh, this is just an example, because we, we wanted to, to focus on that today. Uh, I believe that uh, every aquatic species can maybe uh, raise that kind of, uh, um, of process of work to, uh, to be more sustainable and to, to um, to be nicer to the sea. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stefan. And it was his first uh, conf EASA conference, actually. So welcome to EASA. <laughs> and um, uh, our next speaker is Joan Falcato. And I have a list of uh, titles. <laughs> you all know him. 
He's a, a member of the EASA Executive Committee. He's the CEO of uh, Oceanario di Lisboa. Uh, he's also very important president of AWAC. But the most important thing, he was my trainee. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. This is, uh, yes. Well, my, my role here will be to speak a little bit about the fish that we have in our collections and that we exhibit and that we use as, as communication tools to engage our public. And I imagine most of you, I can't really see you, okay. Uh, most of you come from zoos and there, in my opinion, there are two main big differences when we're talking about the fish and when we're talking about land animals. First, most of the fish that we exhibit, they are foods for somebody, which is completely different. You must be aware that we eat the tigers of the ocean. That's actually the ones we really like because they are carnivorous and the flesh is really good and we eat them. And every choice we make in the fish we will eat, it's actually a conservation action. I have to say, I come from the country that it's 56 kilograms per capita per year, 30 in the world. So the average is 20, we eat 56. Critically endangered species, uh, European eels. You go in a restaurant in Portugal and you eat them by the hundreds, by the tons. So if, if you finally get with the supermarket and they stop selling these threatened species, that's probably the biggest uh, conservation impact I as an aquarium can have. Although in nature I have a lot of work, if I work with the consumption of fish, you can really have an impact. The second very different thing is most of the fish we exhibit, we have no idea how to breed them and raise them. It's not us, it's science that doesn't know it. And it's not because we don't want it. Because most of these fish are multi-million euro business. Bluefin tuna, for example. Millions and millions and millions and millions of euros went into trying to breed and, and, and produce them. We don't know how to do it. So it's different in terms of our capabilities and what we can do about it. So when we talk about sourcing animals for our aquariums, we have to have this in mind. More, if we are fishing and it's a sustainable fishery, should I be spending millions of euros to try and breed a species, or should I collect a few from a sustainable fishery? That's another thing we should ask. Because in aquariums like Oceanario, I have the prislets who have the choice. If I don't spend in breeding, I can spend in conservation. I, I can do that. So many times I think, should I breed this animal and spend all this money, or pick this money and apply in situ conservation? I have to say my option normally is in situ conservation because if it's a sustainable fishery then. So I will go through what we developed in UAC because it's really difficult when it, all, it would be a dream that we would not go for the ocean obviously, but it actually today does not make much sense. So if this doesn't make much sense, let's look at what our options are and we developed obviously this vision where we would like to be the leaders in, in, in sustainability and welfare of, of the acquisition of these animals. And, uh, sorry, that should be white, but it's written there, why do we need guidelines? And basically the, we developed the guidelines because it's very difficult to evaluate the impact of the acquisition it's really difficult if you really go through it. It's not easy. The supply chains you can get, being it from breeders, aquariums, wild, are very large and has a number of suppliers that, 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 are, that are difficult. And because there are many sources and many choices you, can, you have to take, then we decided, well, this will be the first um, guidelines that UAC will develop. UAC is the European Union of Aquarium Curators. It's a bunch of 100 to 150 curators that get together once a year and, and work together to improve their way of working. 
it's not EASA for sure. We don't have many documents and, and, and the amazing work of guidelines is not something we do, but we felt we were the ones that probably had most expertise in relation to the acquisition of these animals, so we decided, well, let's do this one. So I will go through the questions that these guidelines um, go through as well. And basically, they make you think and they give you clues of what's the direction you should be taking. So I have some initial considerations. The traceability is something very relevant. The welfare during the whole process, sustainability, environmental impact, and the documentation. These are the, the six points I will try quickly because I know it's late to go through. And the, the initial considerations, I say, I think they are exactly the same for a tiger and for a fish. They are not different. Why do you want to acquire a particular animal? Why is it? Is it because you want to have it? Is this a collection? No, it can't be today. What's the purpose in our institutional original collection plan? Will there be research? Will there be education related to it? If you have one fish, is there a more sustainable one that you can get that will achieve the same goals? All this process you have to go through is our obligation to have a, a, a very good uh, relationship uh, thought through it. Uh, a very good relationship with the supplier, being it an aquarium uh, a supplier from the wild or a breeder, is also very important in the case of marine fish because you need really to mo know what's the water quality they come from, what's the type of little food they are eating. You need to have all this before, before, before you go. Uh, do we want to communicate to our public why we want these animals? And in Oceanar we do. And because I thought my presentation will be very boring, I, I brought a little film to show you why, how we try to communicate to our public why, why we are getting this animal or that. So can I just touch and it will go, is it? Does it have sound? And this type of communication really works. More than 60,000 people said, saw this. And, and, and if we look at these animals and what we already achieved with them, growth rates, many things we didn't know. Today we are doing a very important study through our animals to understand where the other manta rays are going around just by the food, by the type of food they take in. Today you can pick a little bit of the food they're in and, and know where they have been. And we can do that now because we trained with these animals to know for how long their food will be, how long that it would be uh, giving the results that we, we needed. Then I'll go very quickly through the points and the questions we should be looking into. Uh, um, and when you really want, you should go through, through the guidelines themselves and, and really 
uh, try, try to go through it. So traceability, can your supplier confirm where your animal will, will originate from? Even if it's a breeder, if it, even if it's aquaculture. Again, aquaculture for us sustainably, it's really the future because think of it. I'm very successful finally with one fish and tomorrow I have 2,000 fish in my facilities. Yes, I can spread them around for 2,000 or kill them all uh, because the next time I have 2,000, I don't have a place for them. So what is being started to be achieved is there are some aquacultures that are already working with fish to supply it to our community and that would be ideal for this as uh, a sustainable source of, of animals for us. Can your suppliers so confirm how your animal will get to your institutions? Obviously after you know where it's coming it's essential to know which is the population even genetically if we are going through a, a breeding program. If it's a center again from South Africa, from Miami or, 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 or from Australia, it's completely different. We should not breed them together. So we need really to know where, they, where they're coming from, if they're coming from nature. And then how to transport them. It's really difficult to have long transports for fish. I imagine rhinos and all those animals are the same challenge. But with fish, with oxygen disappearing, with ammonia growing up in the water they're in, you really have to have your knowledge in place so, so it's successful. Many times fish come in little boxes like this inside plastic bags with oxygen inside for very long periods. So, or you pack them right or they will not arrive very healthy and feeling good. Welfare, what are the methods used to collect, breed, handle, pack your animal? All these collect, breed, handle, pack, they have uh, particular issues on the guidelines. We really should make sure that we are getting them uh, in a good welfare. Are you familiar with the facilities in which your animal will be held at each stage of the supply chain? Even for tropical fish, don't forget, it's a multi-million business for the hobby. And so many places that where these animals are held are, are, are not good. 99% mortalities in some cases. We really need to know where your fish is coming from. We really need to do that and, and how it's being uh, done. Are you aware of any issue with this species pre, during and post transport? I mean, there are species that we are aware today that cannot be kept. Some coral species, Pocillopora, not Pocillopora, sorry. I, I can't remember the name, but so many of them they will last one year, looking perfect, they will shrink, and we know it because we got them from confiscations many times, but we know they won't survive, and they are still on the market for sure. So you need to know these things in order to understand should I try to get this animal or not, obviously. Welfare again, can you obtain your animal from, if, if, if it's captive bred, can we get it from an EASA, EUAC, or other recognized captive in breeding program. This is choice number one, obviously. If we could have this for every animal, ideal. Will it be possible? Not for a long period. Not for a long period, for sure. But we have to do our work much better than we have today. Not because of us, I have to say, but because of them in nature. I hope you are all aware that in the last four years we lost 30% of our coral reefs. I do hope you are aware by 2050 the probability we have coral reefs is almost zero. And I do hope you are aware that 25% of the fish species will be gone when the coral reefs are gone. So we really need to know how to breed these animals, not because of Susan aquariums, because of the wild. And that's something we as a community need to commit because nobody else can do it. Nobody else can keep these animals like we can. And we can really have an impact in nature. So can we obtain from another reputable aquarium? And reputable aquariums I need, I mean like in zoos, there are the good ones and there are the not so good ones. So really, it's not just an aquarium, it needs to be a good one. If you cannot source your animal from recognized captive breeding program, or another public aquarium, can it be sorted through a reptile breeder? This is probably, I would say, the future. 
This is probably the future where there will be aquacultures supplying the species we would like, the species we would like to have, to have the education impact we really have. For example, this is a, a zebra shark that came from the deep red. And but these are that have one or two pups every year, they're easy for us. They're not very difficult. The ones that have millions, that's that's the challenge. Corals, for, for, for you to be aware, corals are not a challenge as well. We know how to breed them in every way. It's the fish, the fish that we cannot do it. We don't collect corals from the wild for many, many years. Sustainability. Are there any initiatives your sourcing choice can support to help promote sustainable fish collection? Is your animal from a managed, regulated fishery? And are there data available to support it? Because this is where your choice comes into place. When you have the choice of going uh, in the wild or start a program to try and breed it, see if it makes sense to spend your resources and where. Are there any conservation concerns with this species? When we are talking about threatened species, everything changes. I think every species that we take from the wild that is a threatened species is not the same game. We really should be trying to breed them. We really should have something contributing to nature if we want to have that species. It's really a different game when it's a threatened species and not. Uh, is there any evidence to suggest or indicate that these species you want to acquire is harvested via destructive fisheries? It's not only sometimes it's a, a, a fishery that's OK in terms of sustainability, but the way they are fished is very destructive. So, don't do that as well. This is when we are receiving the fish, five, six, seven hours of work just to acclimatize temperature and water quality of these animals. Environmental impact is the rest. We have an impact as institutions. We have a very big impact. And we really, not only to the fish we are serving in our restaurants, because believe me, it may be a conservation action when you look at the fish you're selling in your restaurant. Uh, all the rest we also have to look. I mean, having aquariums pledging for plastic and then selling plastic in your institution, that's called greenwashing. So be careful, because everybody is looking for greenwashing today. We have to walk our talk if we want to have a bright future. Have you considered the covered footprint in relation to your annual acquisition? And this is worth obviously for fish and for rhinos. Is there a better option in terms of carbon footprint when, when we are transporting them? Does your supplier engage in any research or project that have conservation pro outputs? There are, thank God, many very good suppliers in the fish world. And every time you buy a fish, a percentage of your money will actually go to the conservation of that species. They actually have impact in nature as well. Does your facility engage in any education, research, or projects that have a positive influence on your chosen species? This is going back to the first question I made. Finally, documentation. Obviously, uh, when, in our case, we are sourcing from nature, we source for many countries. And the laws are very different in many countries. So you really have to look into the specific things of each country a high-level aquarium being caught doing an illegal acquisition is something that cannot really happen. We really need to be very strict with this when, when we are doing it. And can your supplier provide many documents, all the documents you need to support this? This is the obvious question. And this was what I would like to talk to you. Uh, to finalize, I would like really for you to think a little bit of, of this. Because the way we use our fish is, yes, we are investing so much money into conservation projects in situ. And probably, we are having a very ne negative impact in other species in our own home. The amount of fish we give our fish to, to, to eat, if it's not from a sustainable source, and Believe me, some of them are becoming more and more difficult. The fish you use for your birds. It's becoming very tough for you to have sustainable fish to feed your birds because they're gone. The ocean is not 
uh, unlimited in resources. And it's our responsibility. If you want to save that bird, please don't kill the fish in order to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Claudia and all of our speakers today. Um, the last part of the campaign plenary is to sign our MOUs. So if we'd like, unless there were other yeah. words you wanted to say. To I, would, I would actually really like the participants of the committee to come up and get an applause. And I see Laura Meyers here, um, Eloise Lemoire. Uh, we have uh, Daniele Rizzelli somewhere, I hope. Uh, I'm not sure if Anna is here. But some of you, please, come up, because this was a lot of work to prepare. Sandrine, Mirko, uh, please, please come up, and uh, we really need a round of applause for all of us, I think. And then we want a picture with all of them. Yes. Can you go over here for your picture? Let's go. Am I Yeah, yeah. Oh, come across. <laughs> 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 And as for the targets and the goals, we have no limit. If all the institutions <laughs> want to subscribe, we're only happy, okay? <laughs> Thanks. Yes, so we'll, if we just encourage uh, Thomas to come up to the stage, and then Thomas and Zhao can sign the MOU between IASA and UAC, and that will finalize the end point to this plenary.